Minnesota has millions of families, each with distinct stories. We've invited three cooks to share their cultural culinary journeys with us. From family recipes to brand new creations. The cooks will then show off their skills, flavors, and ingenuity competing for the crown to be named the winner. The food is delicious and there's room for everyone at our table. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Great, Great Minnesota, Minnesota Recipe. Tonight on the Great Minnesota Recipe. I have a great family. On my dad's side, we're Lebanese and native, and on my mom's side, we're German. I've been on a kind of a mission to reclaim our culture and relearn our ways. You might want to use this. I get out with elders a lot and learning from them, whether it's like the language or stories or about food sovereignty work, going out foraging plants. So this is a very uh, culturally thought out dish. So that's what it's all about, you know bringing more knowledge, education to our communities so they can better nourish themselves and be healthy, live happy and good lives. Funding for the Great Minnesota Recipe is provided in part by Doherty Appliance Sales and Service, Goat Hill Marketplace, the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Derek Nicholas, Redcliffe Band Ojibwe. I grew up outside of Milwaukee and I now reside in Minneapolis. On my dad's side, we're Lebanese and native. We didn't practice too much of our native culture because my grandfather was a boarding school survivor and my grandma didn't want to pass on much of that knowledge. So I've been on a kind of a mission to reclaim our culture and relearn our ways. I started cooking seriously when I was in college. I took on the role of my freshman year as the Native American garden lead. So I was first working with those seeds and keeping the integrity in the songs and stories with those seeds. And as those seeds flourished into plants, I had to learn how to cook them and offer a community feast in the town that I was living in. So I think that's when I really started taking my culinary journey a lot more serious. I've been working in Division of Indian Work for over two years now as the Nutrition Program Coordinator. I just love it here. I have a great team that supports me in the work that I do. Um, my day-to-day -day role may look like cooking for programs, so we have a whole bunch of different programs that cater to different groups, and I try my best to cook healthy, culturally appropriate foods. Welcome, Derek. We're Welcome. really excited to meet you. We were looking at the recipes of all of our chefs, and. I'm particularly intrigued with yours. Thank you. Yeah. I'm excited to let you guys try them out. <laughs> I love sharing my food with everybody and letting people experience new flavors and new foods into their diets. Okay, I'm, I'm really curious. You, you know, you say it started with this garden, right? Who introduced you to that garden? Was there anyone in your family or in your community that really kind of like led you there or was it self-driven? Well, growing up, we had a little garden in our household, mostly like strawberries, raspberries, sunflowers, and stuff like that. So I was always intrigued within the garden. I would be the first one up every morning getting the, the ripe raspberries and not leaving any for the rest of my family. <laughs> but well done. over in college, um, I had to be my supervisor, Mary Jo Floorboard, that kind of introduced me into the food world and the food systems as a whole and kind of uh, ignited that food passion of mine. Who was your cooking mentor growing up? It has to be my mom. You know, my mom would always be cooking new foods in the house, and after every meal, she would ask what that recipe was like a smiley face, and if so, it'd be put into the binder and saved in the, <laughs> in the files for future reference. And so I, a lot of credit goes to her in expanding my palate and being able to try new foods. Today we're doing a flaked walleye salad with a maple vinaigrette. It's one of my favorite recipes for the summertime or just really any time of the year. And it's very nutritious and a lot of these ingredients are found in the great state of Minnesota. That's right. Yeah, I'm looking at a lot of familiar stuff here, which is fantastic to see. Yeah. So to get started on this recipe, we're gonna cook the wild rice and the quinoa together there. They have very similar cooking times. So with the hand harvested wild rice, uh, we've got a two to one ratio, two cups of water to one cup of rice. And then the quinoa is a one to one ratio. 
And uh, the reason why I like to use quinoa is because it's a, a plant from South America. And I believe that historians did not give proper credit to the complex trading routes us natives had. And so this could have easily made it up its way to North America through some trades. And uh, it's a very nutritious food and has a nice texture and some different flavor for the salad recipe today. So this salad, you can really adjust the quantities to however you like it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be more green forward, you can add more herbs and leafy greens. Otherwise, if you really like that wild rice and quinoa, you can bulk it more in that direction. When you season uh, your grains, do you usually put, you use afterwards or do you put it in your, in your cooking water? I put it in my cooking water. So once I add the water, I add some salt. Derek, I'm excited this is not your traditional quick five minute salad. This is pretty complex, I love it. Get it done in 30 minutes. All right. So now we're gonna get started on this walleye. We got a nice filet of walleye sitting right here. And we're just gonna do like a very simple seasoning on this. We're just gonna add some uh, sunflower oil and some salt. Do you typically use sunflower oil? Yeah, I try to use as much sunflower oil as possible. It's a very neutral oil, so you don't get like a ton of flavor from it, but it's, it's good. And so we got an oven bacon at like 350 to 375. That's how I like to cook my white fish for the most part. And we're just gonna bake this until it's glistening. You start to see each layer. That's how I know it's done. So now we can get started on um, some Garlic roasted tomatoes, that'll be like a nice addition in the salad. So we're just gonna take some tomatoes, put them in a pot with some olive oil and some garlic and just have that stew away. It's a lot of garlic, that's great. That's always our rule at home, right? More garlic the better. More right? garlic the better? Yes. If, it, if the recipe says one, you put in three? Three, yep. <laughs> garlic and onion, you gotta love it. Now we're just gonna put this over like a high to medium heat. Do you two ladies like to work on the kale and sure, mango chard? Sure. We just gotta take them off the stalks and kind of. So, where did this recipe come from? Is this your own brainchild? Is this a family recipe? I actually uh, collaborated on this with a friend. So, my friend Kai Gorman, a Diné chef, we were uh, going to a school in Minneapolis to teach the kids a cooking demo and a nutrition lesson, and we're Crafting a recipe to make, and I had a whole bunch of walleye in my freezer that was starting to uh, lose its life, so we kind of needed to use it up, and we came up with this recipe right here. So what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna, uh, you can like char like half of it, and then have the other half fresh. So that's what I'm using the cast iron pan for today. Beautiful char. Wow. It is. Gorgeous char. This big bowl will be for like our fresh ingredients, stuff that's not gonna be cooked. We don't wanna mix our hot ingredients with our cold ingredients, cause then it'll really mess up the salad. And then we'll use one for the hot ingredients. So once it gets like a blistering heat, I'm gonna start putting some of this rainbow chard, some of this kale on, and kind of just like crisp it up, almost like you see with like a kale chip or something right. like that. And this is gonna give like a different texture to the, to the salad. Can you maybe talk a little bit about where and how you fuse your background together? Yeah, um, I do it like a lot of different fusions. I think that it kind of depends on the audience and who I'm cooking for. So I'm German, uh, Lebanese, and Native American. So I kind of tie all those things together. But if I'm cooking for strictly Native folks, then I like to use just Native American ingredients and try to feed people in a way that would be culturally appropriate and feed their spirit as well. So it kind of just depends on who I'm cooking for, I'd say. Of the three kind of backgrounds you mentioned, you're, you're living in Minnesota now. You, you stated that you're from Wisconsin. Is it easy to find all the ingredients you want? Yeah, it's just a matter of knowledge, learning the do's and don'ts for foraging. Unfortunately right now, like a lot of our plants and animals are being threatened to pollution, climate change. So just being very aware of that, you know, I'm not like picking food off the side of the road because of all the runoff and pollution, I'm trying to do things in a safe way. Um, but it's, it's a good challenge. Are there any plants in an urban setting that are easily foraged? Yeah, I mean, anything we can harvest dandelions, plantains, um, 
first lane. Those are just like common weeds. They're not necessarily native to the Americas, but they're commonly food that grows all around us that people can easily identify and harvest and bring to their diets. You mentioned that your background is, your family background is Lebanese, German, and native. Correct. Um, do you find when you're cooking, you kind of lean towards more than the other? Definitely more of the Native American side. I just feel like that food resonates with me better. I get a lot more energy from it. I feel a lot more stronger. Um, and I just prefer like the taste and how it affects my body as well. I handle processing those foods better. And then also that's just kind of the community that I work with, so it just makes more sense to put more of my energy and focus into working with Native ingredients. Are there any folks in the Native world that have really been a special mentors or a special help to you as you've been kind of walking this path? Yeah, um, well, Sean Sherman, the owner of Awamani Indigenous Food Lab, he kind of helped me get started. You know, I worked in the Indigenous Food Lab right when I came out of college and gave me a place to start. And then Hope Flanagan, an elder who I work with, she works with Dream World Health and she's just always gifting me new foods to experiment with and she's very knowledgeable about plants and she's just been a, a great gift in my life and I very uh, value the time I spend with her. How can we make this an exciting different way of trying new foods of our old foods that are now new foods again. For this dressing today we got some olive oil and I'm just checking the heat here just making sure that it's getting to temp. I want this to be pretty hot when we put down the, the kale and the rainbow chard. Alright, some vinegar. We don't want to do too much though. Some salt. Syrup, obviously the more the better. <laughs> I got it. this right here, Sinzi Bakwood Wabu, our maple syrup, very good medicine. Drink it by the court full every day. <laughs> My dentist might not like it, but I do. So now we just need a little bit of pepper and just maybe chop up a couple of these. Could give it a try, see how it is. What does it need, anything? It's pretty decent. I'd put a little bit more pepper in there, though. Oh, geez, and the chili. I forgot. I forgot the heat. I need these uh, chili peppers. Essential. Put a little sass oh, you, in there. You, you're serious about those chili flakes. Man, so good, these though. chili flakes are mild. Come on. <laughs> Did you grow up eating a lot of food with heat? My dad really loves spicy food. I've heard like stories of him doing those like hot food contests. Yeah, and yeah all like that. ghost pepper or anything like that. For him, the more heat, the better. So my mom would always try to cater towards him. So. What do you do for work? I'm the Nutrition Program Coordinator at the Division of Indian Work. So we're a nonprofit based out of Minneapolis and we support the urban native community. So we have a whole bunch of different programs to help out our communities and offer other resources. So as my position as the Nutrition Program Coordinator, I cook for all of our programs that need meals. So for example, we have like a youth leadership development program, which are some native kids that come after school to our build-in. We'll help them with their homework, tutoring, other needs that they have, and cook them a healthy, nutritious meal. We were talking earlier about this, and you were saying that there were some challenges with um, high school kids and getting them excited about foods that maybe they're not familiar with. Yeah, it's kind of difficult to uh, shift someone's diet and it's not gonna happen overnight, so it's just slowly introducing foods. You know, if it was up to the kids, they'd have pizza and hot Takis every day. So trying to shift things in a better direction where they're eating healthier. Wonderful, that sounds amazing. Yeah. You're, you're, you're in the right seat. No, <laughs> All right, well, this wild rice and quinoa is done. We're gonna take this off the heat. I really, really like the, the, the thoughtfulness you put into all the different textures going into this. Yeah, it's just also, all these foods are native to North America, you know. Uh, we can, I mean, maybe not this kale and Swiss chard per se, but we can go out and forage our own leafy greens that we can find all over the forest grounds. 
peppers, you know, those chili peppers, they come from the Americas. Sunflower seed is one of our four sisters. You know, we have the corn, bean, and squash, and sometimes sunflower is our four sister. We got the pumpkin seeds, which are native. Got the sunflower oil, quinoa, wild rice, maple syrup. So this is a very uh, culturally thought out dish. Yeah, so this is the Division of Indian work. We're in our downstairs Dakota Lodge, and this is the commercial kitchen that I operate out of. Uh, I cook here for the programs, then do a lot of food sovereignty events, education around here, and just bringing more access to native foods within the metro community. One of our freezers. I can pull some stuff out. Yeah, I think this is a good starting point. There's kind of some diverse foods here. Pacific cod, whitefish bone broth. This was the uh, leftover grouse. I think I might take the brain out and make like a, like a bird brain omelet. We got a couple smoked ducks. This is some new stuff I've never even worked with before. I got some uh, bison tongue. I think I'm maybe doing some like tacos. Just chop it up really thinly so the kids don't even know. And we got some bison tail in here as well. So this side right here is more of my westernized ingredients. And this side right here is my native ingredients. Uh, so these are kind of like some stuff that I foraged. Right. Here's some bur oak acorns, some shake bar kickery. Uh, this grows up by you guys in Duluth. This is mountain ash berries. You harvest after like the first frost. This is filled up with wild rice and a whole bunch of other goodies. We got some cod, some black rockfish, some halibut. We got some really nice King Kodiak tanner crab. We got some beautiful sockeye salmon. This is probably the best salmon that you can get in the world. We got, this is pretty much where all the protein stuff is. We got a lot of nice ground elk, ground bison. And over here, we got some like Bison hot dogs, bison bratwurst. We got some nice bison kidneys, and there's also some bones in the bottom of this box. Burgers, summer sausage, hot dogs, brats, which are great for the kids because they're really familiar with it, and you can kind of slowly introduce these native foods to them through that way. That pretty much sums up my little operation down here. So we got some good, healthy, culturally appropriate foods to share for the community and the programs that we cook for. Whenever I make this recipe, a lot of people are very surprised about the kale. Uh, I find that not many households like kale. Uh, they just think the bitterness of it's weird, the texture, and uh, they found that the way that I prepare is very uh, appealing to them. So for this recipe, I did like half chard, so it has like more of the crispy chip type of texture and that flavor. Then the other half I massage. So I just uh, take like, the kale like this, put some like oil on it, maybe a little bit of salt and like rub it together. And it makes the a lot more tender. How did the recipe go when you introduced this to the kids? It went good. Uh, they were able to learn a lot of different skills, you know, cooking wild rice, quinoa, making garlic roasted tomatoes, cooking fish, learning how to work with some leafy greens, like this chard and this kale. A lot of uh, learning opportunities. Is that typical of your, your current profession, where you go into the community and teach kids actually hands-on cooking? Is that really yeah. common? That's uh, something that I like to do. We're doing all this work for our future generations. Whenever we do any type of work at all, we always think about seven generations, whether it's seven generations to the past, think about how our ancestors would have done it, or think of seven generations to the future and making sure that the generations in the future have same, equal or better opportunity or access to certain things. And it's a very sustainable model of living and doing things. So that's what it's all about, you know. Bringing better health, bringing more knowledge, education to our communities so they can better nourish themselves and be healthy, live happy and good lives. You mentioned that a lot of your recipes um, were from kind of oral history, right? 
your current influence obviously is live and active. Have you thought about building a legacy in either social media or in a book or something written? Yeah, um, I've been kind of doing that. I published a cookbook um, a couple years ago right when I was my senior year of college. Yeah, then I also founded Wiestenig LLC. I started that up in September of 2021. So we've been open for about a year and a half. And our goal is to create free educational resources around food sovereignty and advocacy work. So for example, um, I just did a video with our Nde Doula expert, Shoshana Kraft, and I made some white fish bone broth, which is traditionally used for maternal medicine. And then I also did a video with Hope Flanagan, Lucenica, and we did the rough grouse, the benet, the original bird, and we took out the crop and made a baby rattle out of it and took out the gizzard and made a charm to be a good moccasin maker. So this is stuff that I wish I knew growing up and had access to. So I'm trying to put it out there in the community so everyone can learn. And I want it to be free so everyone has access to it and there's no barriers. Uh, the way we're able to make these resources free and pay out elders and make sure that everyone's compensated. Uh, we do cooking classes, cooking demos. Uh, facilitate exchange, cultural exchange classrooms, do caterings, uh, keynote presentations on food and colonialism, and then all those funds get recycled back into uh, the organization. So tell me how you check to see if it's done. Yeah, so you can start to see it's really sparkling and glistening. Then you can kind of start to see each individual flake right here. Yes. Each portion. That's that's a good way to know it's done. Otherwise, you can put a temperature gauge in it and measure it that way. So we're gonna let this cool down for a brief moment. And in the meantime, we're gonna take uh, tomatoes out, the wild rice and quinoa out, and we're gonna let all that stuff cool down. It's all coming together here, Derek. Oh yeah. A lot of moving parts, but it's coming together. So we treat our wild rice like gold, you know, it's, it's so valuable to us. So every single speck, every little grain we want to get out, we want to make sure that nothing's going to waste. And we really honor that plant and the gift that it gave. I like how you're talking about using everything that you're um, kind of incorporating, in even, even like the marination. Yeah, really, we don't want any food going to waste. It's very important to us. Are you the guy that people come to you and say, hey, I've got this, and I don't know what to do with it, and it's now yours. That's exactly what happens. <laughs> yeah. And then I always try to make sure that I share my findings back with the people that share things with me and give things in return. When you're looking for kind of a way to cook, a methodology, do you find yourself going back to a cookbook, family recipes, or like, you know, social media, internet? How do you do your research? Um, that's very tough. A lot of native foods, a lot of that has been lost. Um, native American communities, they relied a lot on oral traditions for passing down information and with colonization and the whole genocide of things that happened to our communities, a lot of that knowledge was lost. So you can't really find it written down. You can't find YouTube videos. This is more working with elders, first language speakers, to try to learn those lost things and bring them back to our communities and try to create resources for them if appropriate. So it's a huge gift. Uh, it's really important for me because it feeds my spirit. Um, we believe in the medicine wheel, which represents physical health, spiritual health, mental health, and emotional health. So holding on those four ways is like, helped me walk in a good way. It's really uh, enriching in my life and it's led me to be in the place I'm at now. All right, so now time to assemble the salad. How exciting. It is. So I got the kale and the rainbow chard that was just massaged. And this, now we're gonna add the, the chard mixture in. So now we got a combination of the two. And we're gonna go right in with our wild rice and quinoa mixture with the garlic roasted tomatoes in there as well. Put that in. Then we start just mixing it around. It's really colorful. It is. So there we got our greens in. It's solid. Now we're gonna start flaking this walleye. 
So as you can see, we can kind of just peel off these individual layers right here. Let me start adding a little bit of the garnish so the pumpkin seed. Sprinkle that on there. All right, and now we're gonna finish it off with this nice little dressing we got here. This looks fantastic, Derek. It absolutely looks wonderful. To try this. Mm. Mm. I like how you broke apart the walleye. It makes it really light and fluffy. Mm -hmm. Fish is perfect. Yeah, it is. It's delicious. And I like the um, the tomato. Mm -hmm. Almost acts as a secondary dressing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you. Yeah. It's my pleasure. It's great. Learned so much today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It was absolutely delicious. Next time on the Great Minnesota Recipe. Whoa! I think I enjoy baking a lot more now with the kids. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. My parents, they owned a Mexican restaurant. They kind of taught me how to do everything there, cook everything, and it was a lot of fun. It was a great experience. It's yeah. a family favorite. My husband, he requests it almost every week, I'd say. My mom and I used to make a lot of banana bread together when I was a kid. This is really encouraging to see this recipe that your family loves, that you have really, really made your own. Funding for The Great Minnesota Recipe is provided in part by Doherty Appliance Sales and Service, Goat Hill Marketplace, the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, and viewers like you. Thank you.